You may want to go back and look at the first two videos before reviewing this one if you haven't done so already. In this third and final video, we will go to the lower grate in Texas's starboard engine room. From here, we can visit the big main circulating pump along with lube oil, fire, and bilge pumps. We will also get a better look into the crank pit at the massive main condenser and the critical thrust bearing. The look around will finish with a look in the shaft alley where the propeller shaft leaves the engine room and continues back to where it exits the ship's hull. All right, we're now on the lower grate in the starboard engine room. We're on the outboard side looking aft. We're standing below the main condenser. The first thing I want to show you is that large circular housing. At some point, we'll see it better from the other end. That's the main circulating pump. This pumped vast quantities of seawater into the uh, tank of the condenser. Inside that tank are thousands of tubes that the waste steam coming off the engine ran through, and that chilled that seawater then uh, uh, condensed that steam back into water. That water was pumped out of the uh, condenser and into this big duplex type pump. But this is, isn't just your average pump. This is called an air pump, which is actually does the opposite of what the name suggests. This actually drew a vacuum on the water coming out of the condenser because there is a lot of air dissolved in that water and it had to be removed. So the water is pumped out of this, out of the, the uh, condenser into this. This pulled the air out of it, and then it was sent into what's frequently called the hot well, which is this huge square tank. I'm going to walk past it so we can look back at it. Okay. This also was the main feed water tank. So water was brought into here. This is where it accumulated to go back to the engine room. Now, to get it back to the, I'm sorry, to get it back to the boiler room. To get it back to the boiler room, we had the main feed pump here and next to it an auxiliary. So if you had a failure of the main feed, you had an exact backup of it. Now, uh, under battle conditions, you'd only be using one, but the other one would be just ticking over very slowly, just barely moving. That way, if you had a failure with one pump, the other one could be brought instantly online. You knew it was working and it could take over without pause. Now. From there, the uh, water was pumped down into these lines at 400 PSI, where they go forward to the, uh, to the main engine room. I'm sorry, to the bo three boiler rooms. After this, uh, they could also draw water off of, I'm sorry, nope, about to make a mistake. Never mind. Now we have three more pumps over here. There's one, two, three. These are the lube oil pumps. Oil was pulled out of the uh, engine sump. Uh, it would be hot, it would have crud in it, and very likely even have quite a bit of water in it. So the first thing it does is it goes through the strainer, strains the worst of the junk out of it. It was then pushed into the settling tank, which we've seen in the upper grades, but there's the bottom of it. With that, water could float to the top of the oil uh, any other sediment would, would sink to the bottom of it. It was then drawn off and sent forward to that storage tank that I showed you. Now we see here's a big valve manifold here with pipes coming into it. These are the controls for the, uh, for the emergency uh, fuel oil tanks that are located beneath the engine here and a little bit further aft. And uh, this oil was uh, always kept at around 160, 150 degrees using steam heated coils in those tanks. And if they did need it, they could instantly inject the fuel into the fuel mains by opening these valves. Uh, however, um, but since those tanks are located in the inner bottom, that means the bottom of the tank is the outer hull shell plating. Being riveted design, it's also very possible that seawater has gotten into the fuel. So this was certainly something that they would continuously check on. Over on this side, this is the uh, splash guard for the lower portion of the engine. Now we've got some portable pumps here. These uh, haven't been used in a while, but when we did have flooding a few years back beneath the engine rooms, 
these were what were used to, to pull that water out. If we look down into this opening, there's the fuel lines that tie into the fuel main. Okay, further back here we have basically engineering storage spaces over on this in that door there that leads into the uh, shaft alley, which we'll just peek into at the end of this. But first we're going to step over. Uh, we're stepping over the forward end of the propeller shaft and we'll look at what's going on here. So at the beginning of the video, I pointed out the circular device. This is the main circulating pump. It's driven by the steam engine that's located inside this device that ran off of auxiliary steam. Back here, we have two more large duplex pumps. These are fire and bilge pumps. These are some of the two of the multitude of primary pumps used to either provide pressure to the fire mains to fight fires or to help reduce flooding if there was a hull leak. So that's kind of the long and the short of what's happening with pumps and things. Now, let's peek back into what, to the crank pit. I've shown this on another video, but I did want to show you again. Here's the bottom of those eccentric, eccentric rods, and there's the eccentrics that they're attached to. For it, here's one of the main crank bearings here. This is the uh, connecting rod for the uh, aft low pressure cylinder. Uh, all four connecting rods look pretty much the same. If uh, you watch that, then of course we have more main bearings and then a whole series of more uh, eccentric rods and connecting rods forward of that that are all doing basically the same thing. Now we'll get up here. Here's a better look from the bottom of the eccentrics and the eccentric rods. Here's also a pretty good view of what we call a crosshead. I'm gonna switch over and see if I can get a view of a different one that's a little better. We talked about that before too. Ah, there we go. No, still not getting a good view. It's hard to get a good angle without climbing in and I don't really want to do that right now. But uh, if we talked about it before, since the, this is a double action engine, the uh, valve, the piston rods have to remain perfectly straight when they travel up and down because they have to be sealed so that steam entering the bottom of the piston just doesn't shoot out around the piston rods. Now they are connected with the, to the connecting rod using what's called a crosshead, which is that assembly there. It acts as a hinge so that the piston rod can push up and down. And when it does, that allows the connecting rod to not only push against the crankshaft, but also swing side to side as it rotates the shaft. Okay, here's a little bit better view of that crosshead or crosshead guide. Now, if you just left it at that, the second that you started turning the engine, this whole affair would buckle and be destroyed. In order to hold that uh, piston rod in place, that crosshead had what was called a shoe, slip shoe attached to it. It rode inside that guide. That guide has a slot that allows the uh, shoe to slide up and down. It also has massive plain bearings in it that are flooded by oil to reduce uh, sliding friction. But it, so as the, uh, as the piston rod turned up and down, or pushed up and down, um, it was held in place laterally by the uh, slip shoe. It's riding in the guide, and then that allowed the crankshaft to turn. So that's basically how it worked. So let's come back out. One little last thing to show you. And we really can't see it too well. I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to show you the housing here. This is for what we call the jacking engine. And uh, I have some still photos that I took a while back that I'm gonna switch to and I'll give you a quick description. The jacking engine made it possible for the crew to slowly rotate the engine without applying steam pressure. This allowed them to very slowly turn it as steam was applied to steam jackets and circulated through the drains to warm it before being put into operation. The jacking engine was also very useful when positioning the engine while it was being worked on. 
It was originally powered by a small steam engine that was eventually replaced with the electric motor seen in the photos. As you can see, there is a lot of gear reduction going on that not only slows down the motor's output, but also greatly magnifies its torque. What starts out as 1000 RPM motor speed is reduced to about one steam engine revolution every 8 minutes by the time it goes through all of the reductions. Okay, so the last thing we want to show is another exceptionally important device. Now this engine, when it's turning at full power, it's producing approximately 14,000 shaft horsepower, and that's the rotational energy. So of course it's turning the prop shaft, which extends back aft through the hull, where it atta is attached to a prop. That prop then takes that rotational energy, turns it into thrust, there's only one place where that thrust to go. It's back up the shaft and into the engine where it would immediately wreck the engine, except there's one thing that keeps that from happening. That's in here. This is called a thrust bearing. This is an old style, and this style is, was, this is one of the last times it was used, was on Battleship Texas. The, uh, crank, the uh, propeller shaft travels up through this, and where you see each one of these devices here, there's what's called a shoe or a saddle that sits on it. And it sits over the disc, a disc that's on the crank, on the propeller shaft. And uh, with that, as that propeller shaft tries to push forward, it pushes against each one of these shoes and, and doesn't push that energy up into the engine. Now, what isn't readily seen is that uh, each, the, each end of the shoe is attached to a heavy, very thick threaded shaft that runs up the, runs the entire length of the thrust bearing. That shaft has nuts on each side of the uh, finger that uh, supports each shoe and that allows them to individually adjust the pressure on each one of them to make sure that that its pressure is spread out evenly across them. That in turn, by the way, here's the, major adjusting nut. You can see that's a very large shaft. But from there, that shaft is attached, on each side is attached to the foundation for this and is bolted directly to the structural frame and keel of the ship. That's what takes all of that thrust energy and puts it into the hull to move the ship forward. Now shortly after that, uh, they went to a new design. One of the designs produced by Waterbury if you haven't heard that name before, that's what was used to produce, to, uh, that they produce the uh, hydraulic motors used to drive the turrets. Now that later design, instead of having multiple shoes, actually had discs that were set a little off uh, at an angle to each other, and as it rotated, it forced and built up a heavy layer of oil so that all the thrust was actually uh, thrust through that oil. Now, lastly, here's the, uh, the shaft alley. And you can see there's the propeller shaft as it goes back. Now, when the ship was demilitarized uh, after 1946, the Navy removed the propellers and they, pu they uh, pulled the shaft all the way out of the ship, uh, beginning back at the end of what you see here. That little box sitting on top of it right there is the transducer. If you look, you'll see there's a little gear ring attached to. As the prop shaft turned, it turned that ring, and that translated to an electrical signal, and that was the, what drove the engine tachometer that we saw back up on mid-crate level. So folks, this is pretty much a walkthrough of the engine room. And as you can see, it's very, very complex. It's, it was, became very obsolete once turbines matured, but uh, you at least have the luxury of seeing the last really big marine reciprocating steam engine.